Welcome in, everybody, watching from the wonderful confines of your lovely homes. We welcome you to this uh, live stream service here at New Testament Church. Um, also, welcome everybody that's listening on the Gathering Echo. We're, we're thankful for everyone that joins us through live stream. But I'm also so thankful for all of you here that are that are here in person, that are they're here to support, that come out and are and take part in you know the 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 breaking of the body of our Lord Jesus, man. The just the union and the communion and the fellowship with each other. I'm thankful that all of you are here, and we welcome all of you at home to come take a part of this family. Uh, we don't want to do nothing but love you. That's what we want for you. Uh, we don't. We, we don't want your money. We don't want everything that you can build. We want to love you. We want this to be a place of love. And if we all love each other and we meet at love, then God only knows what we'll do together. So, Father, we ask you this morning to guide my stammering lips. I ask you today to help me to speak your word clearly and perfectly like you've spoke it to my spirit. I thank you for the joy that you have given me. In Jesus' name I pray. I pray for everyone this morning that's battling illness, sickness, fear, uh, everything that they're going through, Lord. I pray for everyone that's dealing with trials and tribulations. Lord, give them clarity this morning to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Bring healing to the situation. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... The title of this is Dog People. Just a, just a little disclaimer. If you're a cat person, this doesn't mean it's not for you. Okay? I want to clean that up to start with. If you're a cat person, this will still relate to you. All right? But we're, we're, we are going to talk about dogs a little bit more than kitties today. Okay? So, you know, maybe we'll do a kitten message. But, and, and you can be here for that. But right now we're going to talk about some dogs. Where are my dogs at? Yeah, there we go. There we, he got that dog in him, man. Got that dog in him. All right. <clears throat> so, as you all, and most of you probably know, um, Kristen and I breed golden doodles. We just got rid of our second litter, actually found homes for, for all of them, and one of them is staying with us again because we're idiots. Um, you know, we have no common sense. And I know all of you are saying that when you see it. It's like, what, what is wrong with them? We don't know. We don't really know what's wrong with us. We're trying to figure it out. We're trying to get clarity from God on why we make these decisions, but you know, we continue to make them, and we continue to have fun. So, you know, we have a lot of dogs, have a lot of kids. Um, but these dogs, man, they, they speak so, so much to my heart, and I, and I really just want to talk about Jesus and puppies. Is that okay? Jesus and puppies. All right. So, Credence, before, I think I've ministered, talked about this a little bit before, but before we had this second litter of, of puppies, Credence came up to Kristen, and Kristen was in the swirl of fear, you know, of wondering how everything's going to go. Oh, my God, Marshall's here now. She's got, she's got a one-year-old plus taking care of puppies. How am I going to do this? And then Credence walks up to her and says what? I can't wait to help you with these puppies. And Credence spoke out of childhood, out of childlikeness, and Kristen was dealing with all this in her mind. Where was she dealing with it as? She was dealing with it as a, an adult, as anthropos. Uh, oh, we got a task to do. We got things we got to take care of. Oh, my God, how am I going to do it? And then Credence comes up in this childlike love and says, Mom, I cannot wait to help you with these puppies. And that right there just, just absolutely changed the way Kristen looked at this. And you know what? This second litter, we, we had a blast doing it. Like, we, we, we hardly ran into any, any trouble. It was just so smooth. We found families for all of them. Everything went great. And I believe it was because of Credence's faithfulness, Credence's uh, calmness, her, her peace that she brought to the situation. So, um, if you have, well, I'm going to read out of the message in Judges. You can follow along in the King James if you would like, but we're going to Judges 6. I'm going to read the majority of it out of the message um, translation just because I feel like it's an easier read. Um, pastor texted me um, a few weeks ago. It was a quote, and I talked about this on a Wednesday night, but he texted me a Wendell Holmes quote, and it says, Men do not quit playing because they grow old. They grow old because they quit playing. I'm going to say it again. Men do not quit playing because they grow old. They grow old because they quit playing. That was the quote. Pastor texted me on a Wednesday. I was kind of in the middle of work, driving. I think I was headed to a lunch break, having a frustrating day. And then I see that text from him, and it's like, oh, that's nice. I, I'm glad he sent it. 
but I'm still having a crap day. <laughs> so then, you know, as I'm on the way home, I, I realized that this is a long story that I'm going to try and compact really short, but I'd gotten a fortune cookie the day before from a Chinese restaurant, and I didn't eat it. I didn't eat it because I sat on it when I got in the car in the Jeep. I like, crushed it. I crushed the fortune cookie. Well, you know, so the next day, the fortune cookie's still in the Jeep, crushed in the wrapper, and I'm driving home, and I'm thinking about the text that Pastor sent, you know, of Wendell Holmes. Men do not quit playing because they grow old. They grow old because they quit playing. And then I almost feel Jesus tell me, you need to open that cracked up, crumbled up fortune cookie. And then I open that fortune cookie from the day before, and the fortune cookie says, if you carry your childhood with you, you never become older. <laughs> so I think, I think I, if God has put me on the earth to do anything, it's to tell you, the stupider it sounds, the more Jesus it is. The more goofy you think this is, the more Jesus it is. The sillier that the, the thing may be, the more likely it is to be God. Because if he, can, if he can prick against your anthropos, if he can pick against the scab of your anthropos and cause you to put away your reasoning for a minute and just delve into something that's fantastical, like opening up a cracked up fortune cookie, and it's saying the same thing, echoing the same quote, echoing the same sentiment that Credence comes to her mother and says, I cannot wait to, to get these dogs. I can't wait to help you with these dogs. Because adulthood just makes everything such a drag. I mean, it does. It's just such a drag to be an adult. Like when we were kids, we were, could not wait. Man, I can't wait to grow up. And now we're here and it's like, man, we really had it made back there with the hose pipe and, uh, you know, playing in the water. And now we got stuff to but, 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 but. It doesn't mean that we still can't be who we're supposed to be. So let's get into Judges 6 before I go rambling. I feel like, I feel like Gideon personifies, the story of Gideon personifies this tremendously. So I'm going to do some reading. Verse, chapter 6, verse 1. This is in the message again, so if you want to follow in the King James, that's fine. It'll be a little more complicated, but if you don't, just read, just listen. It's cool. Yet again, the people of Israel went back to doing evil in God's sight. God put them under the domination of Midian for seven years. Midian overpowered Israel. Because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves hideouts in the mountains. Sounds like adulthood. The people of Israel were overtaken by the Midians. So they found hideouts in the mountains because they were being besieged. Where does the little you go? Where does the childlike you go when you grow up? You find your hideouts, caves and forts. When Israel planted its crops, Midian and Amalek, the Easterners, would invade them, camp in their fields, and destroy their crops all the way down to Gaza. They left nothing for them to live on, neither ship nor ox nor donkey. Bringing their cattle in tents, they came and took over like an invasion of locusts, and their camels passed counting. They marched, and, they marched in and devastated the country. The people of Israel reduced grinding pro were reduced to grinding pro poverty. Excuse me. I got a mint in my mouth. It's like too much spit. Sorry. The pitying, the, 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 pitying, the people of Israel reduced to grinding poverty to Midian, cried out to God for help. One time when the people of Israel had cried out to God because of Midian, God sent them a prophet with this message. God, the God of Israel, says, I delivered you from Egypt, I freed you from a life of slavery, I rescued from Egypt's brutality, and then from every oppressor. I pushed them out of your way and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am your God, I am God, your God. Don't for a minute be afraid of the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But you didn't listen to me. So this is this picture of our life, this picture of adulthood, this picture of what our life ended up being. We're in hideouts, we're in forts, we're in caves, and we grow these crops, and we do these things, and you go and you work so hard, and you make a, a wage, and you go and you get a week's paycheck, and then they come and take everything. The bills, life, the washing machine that breaks, the leak, something's always leaking at my house, always. You can hear it in the silence of the night. Ah. 
that's being an adult. I'm like, God, I've got to fix that leak. And then I call my friend over, and he's like, oh, man, it's just a spigot. That's fine. I'm like, oh, cool. All right, that's cool. But we work, and we, and we build all this stuff up, and we work so hard to make a living and do the right thing. And then they come and take it like a bunch of locusts. <laughs> but the childlike is still there, right? Is it? I hope so. Doesn't sound like it. They're in hiding. Sounds like really good in here this morning. Is the childlike still there? Yeah, heard it from a deep cave somewhere. All right. Verse 11. One day the angel of God came and sat down under the oak in Ophra. Ophra. How we say it? Help me. Ophra. Orpa. Orpa. I got an O P H R A H. Ophra. Okra? <laughs> so he's sitting under the oak in Ophra. Ophrah, there we go, that belonged to Joash the Abizarite. Joash was Gideon's dad, whose son Gideon, well, should have just read, whose son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. Out of the sight of the Midianites, the angel of God appeared to him and said, God is with you, almighty warrior. So Gideon is under an oak. That's significant if you read Isaiah 61, because we become what? oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. So he's sitting under the oak, and he's grinding wheat. He's threshing wheat. That's also significant, too. He's at the wine press. Gideon is hiding out under the oak. All this is such a beautiful picture of what's about to happen. Gideon's in a place of reflection. Gideon's working. Gideon's trying his best. He's in a place of solitude. And then he hears God, the angel of the Lord, say, God is with you. Almighty oh, warrior. There's, here's here's it gets fun. Get it, and Michael's pastor, he, he preached this, and this was really, really good. I tried to find Michael's old message. Hopefully we can recover that somewhere. It was great. It was great. I was hoping you would send me some notes last night. Didn't happen, but it's okay. I still love you. I like your gold chain. All right. Gideon replied, with me? With me? God is with you, mighty warrior. With me? Me? I think it was that high pitch. Me? With me? God is with me? My master with me? If God is with us, here, here it is. If God is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracle wonders our parents and grandparents told us about, telling us didn't God deliver us from Egypt? The fact is, here's Gideon telling God what the fact is, God has nothing to do with us. He has turned us over to Midian. But God faced him directly. Go in this strength that is yours. Whose strength was it? Gideon's strength. Go in the strength that is yours. Save Israel from Midian. Haven't I just sent you? It had to be you. It had to be you. It had to be Gideon. Haven't I just sent you? Then Gideon replies, Me? Me? Again, Gideon with the me. Me? You're talking to me? My master? How and with what could I ever save Israel? Look at me. My clan's the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the runt of the litter. That's why I picked the message, because that's so beautiful. I'm the runt of the litter. I'm the littlest one. I'm the smallest one. I'm the least of the least. How could you call me a mighty warrior? God said to him, I'll be with you. Believe me. You'll defeat Midian as one man. Do you want to know something interesting? Apparently Gideon, this is in the footnotes here, apparently Gideon belonged to the upper class, perhaps a kind of aristocracy, in spite of his disclaimer in verse 15. Because if you go, if you go on up into verse 20, we're going to get to verse 27, you're going to see that Gideon has soldiers. Gideon is saying he's the least of the least of the least of the least, and he's got soldiers, and he's part of an aristocracy. Is that, am I saying that right? Arist say it again. Aristoc say it again. Aristocracy. Aristocracy. 
aristocracy. There we go. So Gideon's a part of an arist. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm trying to say? So he's a big deal. He was he was a big deal until he believed that he wasn't. It's kind of like us. He was a big deal until he believed the lies that he wasn't. Just like you were in the backyard when you were little, you were a big deal until you grew up and believed you weren't. You believed, grew up and stopped believing the goodness of God. Stopped believing that God had a plan for you. Stopped believing that God was still in, still, still. I was about to say still in control because that's like you know old old style preaching. But He can be in control if we let Him. He can be in control of your life, but He's not going to take the wheel. It's not Carrie Underwood. Now, if you ask Him like Carrie Underwood did, Jesus take the wheel. He'll take the wheel, but He's not just going to jump in the car and take the wheel. You know, sometimes he does. But most of the time, you know, this whole God's in control stuff. Well, uh, that's tough. God wasn't in control when I didn't check my tire. God wasn't in control when I didn't check my gas. God wasn't in control when I didn't get an oil change for five years and wondered why the motor stopped. Well, if God's in control, why is my car a piece of junk? Because you're not doing a good job. You're not being faithful with little. You're not being faithful with the little that you got. You're not checking. You may not be driving a Maserati, but if you got a Nissan Altima that you don't check the tires on, don't be fussing at God for not giving you the Maserati. All right, I didn't mean to do all that. Sorry. Verse 17. Gideon said, if you're serious about this, do me a favor. Give me a sign to back up what you're telling me. Don't leave until I come back and bring you my gift. He said, I'll wait till you get back. Gideon went and prepared a what goat? A young goat. Very significant that it is a young goat. And a huge amount of unbraised bread. He used over a half a bushel of flour. He put the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and took them back under the shade of the oak tree for a sacred meal. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and unbraised bread, place them on the rock, and pour the broth on them. Gideon did it. The angel of the Lord stretched out the tip of the stick he was holding and touched the meat and the bread. Fire broke out on the rock and burned up the meat and bread and bread while the angel of God slipped away out of sight. And Gideon knew it was the angel of God. Gideon said, Oh, no, Master God, I have seen the angel of God face to face. But God reassured him, Easy now, don't panic, you won't die. Then Gideon built an altar there to God and named it God's Peace. It's still called that at Off Ophrah of Abiezer. I'm having a really hard time reading today. I'm sorry. Verse 25, Ophrah, Ophrah. Beauty out of Isaiah, another Isaiah 61 reference. I like it. All right, verse 25. Let's keep trucking. That night this happened. God said to him, take your father's best seven-year-old bull. You're about to see some connections here. Because Gideon had to get the what? The young goat. Gideon got the young goat to sacrifice. And God set fire to the goat and confirmed to Gideon that I'm with you because the goat, the young goat, represented the young Gideon that once believed who he was. And God sets fire to the youth. God sets fire to the childlike. God sets fire to the young you that believes that who you are. But then he tells him to go get. His dad's what? Go get his seven-year-old bull. Seven is a sign of completion. Seven is the, is, is the maximum age. He didn't say go get a 60-year-old bull. It's probably not one. He said go get a seven-year-old bull, and I believe it's significant because it's a full-age bull. The prime one, tear down your father's bell altar and chop down the Asherah fertility pole beside of it. Then build an altar to God, your God, on the top of this hill. Take the prime bull and present, present it as a whole burnt offering using firewood from the Asherah pole that you cut down. Gideon selected ten men from his servants and did exactly what God told him. But because of his family and the people in the neighborhood, he was afraid to do it openly, so he did it at night, like Nicodemus. Early in the morning, the people in the town were shocked to find Baal's altar torn down. The Asherah pole beside it chopped down and the prime bull burning away on the altar that had been built. They kept asking who did this, questions and more questions, and then answered, now someone answered, Gideon, the son of Joash, did it. This is so good, verse 30. The men of the town demanded Joash. 
bring out your son, he must die. He tore down the bell altar and chopped down the Asher, Asherah tree. But Joash stood up to the crowd. Woo! Man, that's good. Pressing in on him. He stood up to the crowd, pressing in on him. And he said, are you going to fight Baal's battles for him? Are you going to save him? Anyone who takes Baal's side will be dead by the morning if Baal is a god, in fact. Let him fight his own battles and defend his own altar. Kale. So it was Gideon that broke. He got his dad to come back into his child life. Because his dad didn't wake up and say, oh, my God, what has my son done? His dad woke up and saw the real Gideon. And when he did, he saw the real Joash. He saw the young Joash. And they were pressing in on him and said, we're going to kill your son for what he's done. And he said, you're not going to kill my son. Matter of fact, won't you let Baal fight back? Won't you let him fight back? And I plead this with you today. You may think that everything you've built is sustaining your life. You may think that your works sustain your life. You may think that everything that you go out and do on the weekdays sustain your life, but it's not who you are. You may go to the job that provides the bills, that provides the, the living for you, but it's not who you are. Adulthood is not the answer. We need to redefine adulthood. Everybody looks at me like I, they're looking at a brand new gate in the pasture. You're looking at me like a cow in the pasture, man. This is a brand new gate. I've never seen one this shiny before. Yeah, I'm talking about adulthood stinks. I'm saying it. And there's something that's rising up within you right now. I can feel it that says, yeah, but. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. Well, that's the same thing that rose up in Joash and had him supporting Baal. That's the, that yeah, but was the same thing that made Joash go all in on Baal. But then when Gideon had the faith to go under the cover of night and to destroy the, the bell altar, the, the, everything, the, the tear down the tree, and Joash comes out and he sees him pressing in on him, something happens inside and he says, I know my son and I know who I am, so let's let Baal fight the battles. And he can't. Verse 33, all the Midianites and the Amalekites, the Easterners, got together, crossed the river, and made camp in the valley of Jezreel. God's Spirit came over Gideon. God's Spirit came over Gideon. He, he blew the ram's horn trumpet. I want you to remember that. God's Spirit came over Gideon, and when it did, he blew the ram's horn trumpet. Remember that. And the Abizarites came out, ready to follow him. He dispatched messengers all through Manasseh, calling them to the battle, also to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. They all came. Now we're going to jump on to chapter 7, because Gideon, uh, Gideon, Gideon still needed some confirmation through all that. So verse 1 of chapter 7, Jerubbaal, Gideon, got up early the next morning because he's been nicknamed Jerubal, which means one that contends with Baal. That's what they named him. They named him the one that fights Baal. They named him the one that contends with Baal. So he got up, all his troops, all his troops, all his, say all his troops, all of them because Gideon tried power in numbers. Right there with him, they set up camp at Herod Spring. The camp of Midian was in plain, in the plain north of them near the hill of Morah. God said to Gideon, you have too large an army with you. I can't turn Midian over to them like this. They'll take all the credit saying I did it all myself and forget about me. Make a public announcement. Anyone afraid, anyone has any qualms at all, may leave Mount Gilead now and go home. Twenty-two companies left, headed for home, Ten companies remained. God said to Gideon, there are still too many. Take them down to the stream, and I'll make a final cut. When I say this, when I say this one goes with you, he'll go. When I say this one doesn't go, he won't go. So Gideon took the troops down to the stream. To the stream. God said to Gideon, this is big. Everyone who laps with his tongue the way a dog laps sat on one side. And everyone who kneels to drink, drinking with his face to the water, set to the other side. Three hundred lapped with their tongues from their cupped hands. All the rest knelt to drink. God said to Gideon, I'll use the three hundred men who lapped at the stream to save 
you and give Midian into your hands. All the rest may go home. So God takes it from like thousands all the way down to 300 because he said, all right, you're going to have two groups of people that run to this water. There's going to be a group of people, the larger group, they're going to they're jump down. They're going to face first bury themselves in that water. They're going to they're gonna crawl down in that trench. And just like we would if we were really thirsty in a desert or something, you see water, you're jumping down, man. You're cupping both hands. You're just drinking that stuff up. But the 300 that laughed like a dog would have had to have knelt. And they would have had to have cupped and brought the water to their mouth and been circumspect, watching, still being faithful to the cause. Because when all the men jumped in the water to feed, to, to get refreshment for themselves, they were taking the most they could get. It wasn't about Gideon. It wasn't about the army at that point. It was about them. But for the 300, it was about them making sure that Gideon was okay making sure that the army was okay. Thank God for men in our lives that do that. Thank God for women in our life that do that. There's something I, I've noticed about, about Pastor Curtis. We go, out, we go out and eat with them a lot on Sundays. And no matter where we are in a restaurant, he will always take the seat that's facing the door. And he does that because he is not going to sit there. Even though we're having a great Sunday, sir, Sunday meal is great, Curtis is still thinking about the safety of everybody in the building. It's what men do. It's what good men do. It's what those 300 men did. They laughed water like a dog. And here Yahweh, Jesus, is pointing to the dog. We're getting to the dog, I promise. All right, jump to verse 15. Verse 15. So, Gideon had a lot more doubt. <laughs> he needed a lot more confirmation. We're not going to read through all that. This is stuff about a fleece being covered in dew and not being covered in dew. You can read it on your own time. But when Gideon, oh, so Gideon jumps down there and hears the dream of one of his uh, one of his men. He hears his dream. When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he went to his knees before God in prayer. Then he went back to the Israelite camp and said, "Get up and get going." God has just given us the Midianite army. Have you ever had a Holy Ghost confirmation? You're like, it's God, man. It's him. That was what happened when I opened that fortune cookie. This is like, oh, yeah, he just gave me the Midianite army, man. I knew it was God. I knew it was him that crumbled up cookie. It's like when, when I heard God say, hey, I know this sounds crazy, but you need to go to the beach by yourself. And then I show up there, and y'all know the story. Y'all know the story. He, 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 he takes me to the Isle of Palms by myself because I heard of just something nudge me to go. And then God shows up with total strangers, and I get baptized right there on the Isle of Palms because they were having a makeup baptism. Can you say Holy Ghost? Holy Ghost confirmation, man. How many of you have got that when somebody had a dream? Man, like I've been thinking about something, then all of a sudden somebody come up to you and be like, Brent does it all the time to us, man. He's like, he comes, I, just, I had this dream last night, and it's exactly what you're going through. And it's like, God, there it is. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost time. Holy Ghost time. It's like Power Rangers, man. Go, go, Power Rangers. Here we are. This is real. It's God. He's gave us a Midianite army. It's, like, it's, exactly what, it's exactly what Gideon did. It's like, he heard that dream. He's like, go, go, Power Rangers. It's like, we're going to take the Midianite army tonight, man, because I heard that dream. Even though the stew on the rock and the fleece and the dew and all that wasn't enough, this dude had some random dream, and now I know God's gave me the army. There's something to believing with others. There's something to getting confirmation for yourself through the life of others. Why you can't be an island. No man is an island. You can get all the confirmation you need from God on your own, sure. But there's something about when I come to Matt and he gives me confirmation in what I've been finding out on my own personal prayer life. There's something about it. All right, I'll keep going. So, verse 18. He divided the 300 men into three companies. He gave each man a trumpet. What's the trumpet represent? Spirit. Because I told you to remember that. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. He blew the ram's horn trumpet. Right? So then he gives all the guys, he gives, he gives them a trumpet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
He divided 300 men into three companies. He gave each man a trumpet. That's a lot of trumpets. That's 300 trumpets. I mean, that's, that's impressive. It's a lot of trumpets. I, maybe not impressive to you. That's a lot of trumpets. You think about 300 trumpets, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a pretty obnoxious sound. <laughs> he, all right. So he gave each man a trumpet and an empty jar. That reminds me of the Pirates of the Caribbean. It's like a job debt. He gave me. A, he gave each man a trumpet and an empty jar. Here's how the Bible contradicts itself: with a torch in the jar. We just read right through it. He gave each man a trumpet, an empty jar, with a torch in the jar. That would make the jar not empty. Duh! Am I the only one that picked up on that? He gave each man an empty jar, with a torch in it. So the jar is not empty. But the Bible's calling I got you, I got you. But the Bible's calling it empty. Gideon is the big deal. But he's calling himself the run of the litter. Gideon's a huge deal. He's got his own soldiers. We're finding out he's got thousands of them. And he's under a tree talking about how small he is. And here we have this jar that represents Gideon, it represents you, it represents Anthropos, it represents manhood, and it represents you believing that you're nothing. It represents you believing that you're empty. It represents you believing that you got nothing to offer. It represents you believing that life didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. My life's just nothing. My life's going to stink. This is going to stink. This is going to be bad. It's going to go bad. It always goes bad. I'm empty. But there's a torch in the jar. There's a torch in the jar because the jar is not empty, even though the Bible said it was. <laughs> the Bible said the jar is empty, and the very next line says there's a torch in the jar. You're not empty. Hear me. You're not empty. You're not empty. I don't care what you think, you're not empty. There's a torch in the jar. There's a young goat that you have to prepare. There's a young goat that you have to prepare. There's a child like in you that can set you free. Come on, let's keep going. This is, I'm telling you, this might hit you like Thursday. You'll be like, oh, I get what he's saying now. They blew, all right, so Gideon and his hundred, all right, well, I'm going to back up. He said, watch me and do what I do with your trumpet in your empty jar with a torch in it. Watch me and do what I do. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly what I do. When I and those with me blow the trumpets, you also, all around the camp, blow your trumpets and shout for God and for Gideon. Such a Mel Gibson line right there. Gideon and his hundred men got to the edge, because Mel Gibson would so say that. Like, if he was playing Gideon in this part right here, he's like, you, you go to the edge of the camp, and when you do it, you say, for God and Gideon. I could see Mel Gibson doing it. He's such a, man, he's the patriot. He's the patriot. Such a good movie. So he says, you say, for God and for Gideon. And they, and they did it. Gideon and his hundred men got to the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the watch, just after the sentries had been posted. They blew the trumpets, which represented what? Spirit, thank you. At the same time, smashing the jars they carried. All three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held the torches in their hands and the trumpets in their right hands, ready to blow and shouted, A sword for God and for Gideon. They were stationed all around the camp, each man at his post. The whole Midianite camp jumped to its feet. They yelled and they fled. When the 300 men blew the trumpets, God aimed each Midianite sword against his own companion all over the camp. They ran for their lives to Beth Shittah, toward Zerera, to the border of Abel Mahola near Tabath. Israelites rallied from Naphtali, from Asher, and from all over Manasseh. They had Midian on the run. Yeah, man. Woo! That was fun and a lot of hard words. So, 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 all right, bear with me here because this is a lot of, this is a lot of stuff. This is a lot of stuff right here. We're, going, we're done with the message. Uh, take, take your King uh, James and go to John 4 because uh, this has got a ton of symbolism in it. It really nerds me out and gets me happy. Anybody know who T.D. Jakes is? Let's hear it. Oh, yeah, listen, T.D. Jakes. All right. So T.D. Jakes says this. 
This is this is awesome. This is the only good thing I've ever found on TikTok ever, ever. I found this. I deleted TikTok. I'm like I'm done. That's that's what I was here for. I often tell people that God doesn't make chairs. This is TDJ. Pay attention. This is good. And he doesn't make tables. God doesn't make chairs, and he doesn't make tables. He makes trees. I'm not saying you should pray until you see a table because God's not going to make a table. But if praying calms you to the point that you look at a tree and now you see how to make a table, then prayer puts you in a place of provision. Prayer anchors your soul and it releases your creativity. And it tells you what to do. I love how T.D. Jake says it. Like, and it tells you what to do with what you got. Oh, man, it's so good. Almost every miracle in the scriptures occurred by the prophet or Christ using something that the person already had, whether it was two fish and five loaves or bread or the pot of oil or the handful of meal. It was something that was already in the house. If you pray, God will show you something. That is unique, that exists in your house, that he will use to bless your life. I mean, he couldn't have done it no better. It's great. Because Gideon does the same thing. What, what did, did God, like, roll in tanks from 2023? No. Did he, did he bring in Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones from Men in Black? No. No. He told Gideon to get up and get your men. And then Gideon went and got his men, and God said, that's too many. And he broke it down again, and he broke it down again until there were 300. And what was he showing Gideon? It's almost as if he was going all the way back to the oak tree when Gideon said, I'm nothing, I'm empty, I'm the run of the litter. And God said, okay, nothing, empty, and run of the litter. Let's go look at your huge, stinking army. And God said, well, this, since you think you've got nothing, let's just really give you what you think you've got. Because in Gideon's mind, he probably really thought his army was about like what the 300 men looked like. You know, we're just little. We're, you know, we look at what's going on all across the world right now, and you may feel small. We look at what's going on in our own nation. We look at what's going on in our own society, and it may be easy for you to feel small. You may watch the news at night and feel like we're encompassed about by the Midianites, and it may be tempting for you to feel small, but God keeps keeps, keeps cutting it down until what? Until you realize it had to be you. It had to be you. It's not even about God delivering Gideon. It's about Gideon delivering himself because God uses what you've already got. So we sit here and we wonder how we're going to do all this stuff. How are we going to go do, how are we going to raise four kids? <laughs> how are we going to do all this? But prayer brings us to the place of peace. That's why Gideon went back and renamed the place peace, God's peace. You go back to where you were under the tree and you heard the voice. You go back to when you were a kid and you first heard the voice. And that same voice is with you now, telling you it's going to be okay no matter what you face. It may look like the Midianite army. It may look like the end of the world. It may look like the doom of everything that you know. But I am with you, mighty warrior. I am with you, mighty warrior. Man, all right. John 4. This reminds me of St. Fatini. Remember St. Fatini? Or the woman at the well. That's what it says in your Bible. Because you can't give, you know, the woman credit, right? That's what church history's taught us. You know, if it's a woman, we better better calm that one down. Don't want anybody to figure out that God works through women. God forbid. The woman's name is Saint Fatini, and she is like the bomb diggity, all right? That's her name. Saint Fatini. Write it in big bold letters over John 4. This is her story. We're not going to read the whole story because we've done that before. But there's symbolism in the Gideon story and her story. Because she's got what? A empty water pot. Gideon had empty jars, right? And the empty jars re represented the empty men, which represented adulthood and life, and I feel so broken and empty inside. Although there's a torch in the jar. Oh, you see what I'm doing? 
The empty jar of Anthropos in the Gideon story, Baal only got them so far. Empty. Adulthood in Anthropos only gets us so far. Empty. Michael quoted Wednesday night, Hillel, which is Gamaliel's grandfather. Correct? He gave that to you. You gave that to me right before service. Hillel is Gamaliel's grandfather. And Gamaliel is who Paul studied under. Okay? So this is what Hillel said, who was Gamaliel's grandfather. My humiliation is my exaltation. And my exaltation is my humiliation. Her humiliation brought her to a well at noon. Her humiliation. Her humiliation brought her to the well at noon because she couldn't go in the cool of the day with the other women because she was ostracized. She was cast out. She was shamed. She was empty. Jesus tells her, give me something to drink. <laughs> That's what he's telling you. Give me something to drink. I've got nothing. My jar's empty. Yeah, but there's a torch in it. There's, there's still a torch there. You go get that young goat. Go get the young goat, man. The water pot represents Anthropos, adulthood, everything she had believed about herself. Every lie of man was, was wrapped up. Everything that she believed she was not was brought into the physical manifestation of her empty water pot. Okay? So, verse 21. Jesus says to her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes... When you, you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Because she had just told him, your people worship in this mountain, my people worship over here, we worship over there, y'all worship over here, blah, 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 blah. And Jesus is leading up to the, one of my favorite lines in the Bible where he says, your people worship you know not what. I think he said it in King James. It's like, you worship you know not what. So, woman, believe me, the hour that cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is. When the, so, who's the now is? Fatini. Because she's talking about all this religious tradition. Your people worship here. Y'all go to church there. Y'all believe in this. We believe in that. We believe in this. You believe in this. We have to stay separate. Duh. We can't be together. Jesus says, your people worship, you know not what. But the hour's coming and now is when the true worshipers will arise. And if the, now, the hour now is, he had to have been talking about Fatini. Do you know what the word for worshipers is? It's proskenetes, which is an adorer, a worshiper. It's from the root word proskuneo, meaning, here he goes, everybody pay attention, meaning to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. That's what proskuneo means. To kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. To fawn or crouch, to literally and figuratively prost prostate prostrate oneself in homage to a door. <laughs> y'all 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 feel what's happening. It's happening. It's Goko Power Rangers, man. It's coming. It's it's coming like a freight train. All right. For the Father seek all right, but look, let's back up here, verse twenty jump down to twenty three. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers Who's the true worshipers? The true ones that lick like a dog licking his master's hand. Those are the true worshipers. They are arising and they're here now. Oh man, here it is. They shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. You want to hear the best definition you're ever going to hear on spirit and in truth? It's the empty jars with the, with the torch in them and the ram's horn. That's spirit and truth. 
because they held the horn in one hand and they held the flame, the torch in the other hand. This is truth. What is truth? You have always been who I've wanted you to be. I've adored you from the moment I made you. Before the world was formed, you've been my beloved. You're my child. You're my daughter. You're my son. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That's truth. And then the spirit is the ram's horn. Those people worship in spirit and in truth. That's how they took over the Midianite army. They smashed the empty jar that represented all the stuff that you're trying to be. They smashed the jar of Anthropos. Yes, from a broken life, they smashed the empty jar. They smashed the empty jar. They held up the horn. They blew the horn. They held the horn in one hand, the trumpet in one hand, and the fire, the torch in the other hand. And this is worshiping in spirit and in truth. Because once you see the truth of who you are, the Spirit will come upon you. Because the Spirit's already inside you. It's already indwelling you. But it will come upon you and baptize you once you see who you really are. Man, once you see, I know who I am. It was when Gideon finally realized, well, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, Jeff done had a dream. God showed me all this stuff. He showed me the fleece. He showed me the dew. He showed me all these signs. But when you get with somebody that sees it in you, (laughs) thank you, Lord. Thank you for every person in my life. Thank you. Thank all of you for pointing to me, pointing at me and saying there's something in you. And you know what that does? That fires me up. That builds me up. I said what it does for each other. When you look at somebody and you say, it's not just you, Alex, that feels that. I feel it too for you. It's real. It's like Josh says all the time. We keep saying it. We've said it ever since we went back and watched um, Hook. It's all real. It's all real. This is really happening. God has given us the Midianite army. Francois came in and told us that he's giving us, God is giving us the United States. He literally told us that. God's giving us the United States. And you may think it foolish for me to believe it. You may think it foolish for me to think that our little army, our little 300 men with empty jars with torches in them, (laughs) with empty jars that you say are empty, but there's a torch inside. There's a torch inside that'll light the world up, Brent. There's truth, and the truth is you are all he wants. His goodness is running after me, chasing me down like a puppy dog. His goodness is running after me. And I lay it all down and surrender. I surrender. I'm done running. I'm done running from the call. I'm done running from the call. I'm not hiding under the oak anymore. I'm not going to hide from the Midianites anymore. I'm not running from trouble. I'm looking it right in the face, and I'm saying greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm walking up to the situations, and I'm saying I can fix this. I don't know how, but I believe God's going to allow us to fix it. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it, and he's going to use what we've already got in the house. Thank you, T.D. Jakes. Man, that's good. Joker is good. All right. Proskuneo means to adore, to lick like a dog licking a master's hand. She saw this in Jesus. Something happened in that conversation. Something shifted in her, and she left her water pot. She left her water pot behind. She left the water pot behind just like Gideon's army smashed the jars. Just like they smashed the jars. Because this little light of mine, (laughs) I'm going to let it shine. Not going to hide it under a bushel. I'm going to let the world see it. Man, I just feel God. I feel God so strong. All right. All right. Let's jump to Matthew 15. Matthew 15, then I'll try and land. Because this is really what I wanted to preach about. (laughs) All this other stuff was just the goodness of God being added on oh man Matthew 15 glasses are foggy ah all right 
Matthew 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. Thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. There's the empty jar. There's the empty water pot. She comes, her daughter is possessed, her daughter is sick, her daughter is just in just in terrible shape. We don't know what the illness was, but her daughter, you had to believe her daughter was at the point of just death. This woman comes to Jesus for her daughter that's sick and says, Son of David, have mercy on me. And he answers her not a word. And how many of you are right there? Right now. I've cried out. I've asked him for help. And he refuses to help me. I've asked God to deliver me. And he won't. I've asked him to make life better. And it isn't. I've asked him to fix my situation. And he hasn't. And she says, Son of mercy, Son of David, have mercy on me. And he answered her, Not a word. But thank God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Let me just read this to try and break off a little bit. Oh, man. The Hebrew Matthew is a Canaanite woman. Canaan included the region of modern day Lebanon. Canaanite refers to a non-Jewish person that lives in the region. So she was a, a Canaanite. She would be considered an, a non-Jewish person, person. It was in this region that Jezebel established Baal worship. Now Jesus is going to define true worship with this woman. It was in this region that Jezebel built Baal. She established Baal worship. She established it in this region. And I wonder, as this woman comes to Jesus and says, Son of David, have mercy on me, if Gideon didn't go through Jesus' mind, if Gideon didn't come up, when Gideon had the courage to go out in the cover of night and tear down Baal, and his father stands back up and says, You're not taking my boy, man. Oh, this is God. This is Jesus. Let's keep going. So he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. He answered her not a word. Gideon is saying under the tree, How could God be with us? How is God really with us? The Midianites, they take everything we've got. We go plant harvest, we go plant crops and we harvest them and they come and they take them like locusts. How can God really be with me? I've cried out to him and he doesn't answer. How many of you can testify to this story? How many of you have lived this story? I have. I've been there. I have been to the point of breaking in church, growing up in church because you know what they offered me? They offered me the same sentiment that the stinking disciples have right here. They offered me the same sentiment, and it's why Josh's teachings through Judas, the gospel of Judas, are so important. Because they get it dead wrong right here. They get it dead wrong. She runs up. Jesus is teaching his disciples, and she says, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is homesick. Can you hear it in her voice? Man, I could just hear it in her voice. Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And he ignores her totally. Ignores her totally. And his disciples selfishly, deep down, smiled a little bit about it. Deep down, they enjoyed it because she wasn't a Jew. Deep down, they were glad that Jesus didn't pay her any attention because they were fighting for the head of the table. They were fighting for the chief seat. They weren't fighting. Oh, man. They weren't fighting for everybody. 
They were fighting for themselves. They were just like the men that left the water. They were just like the men that went and buried their face in the water. That's what they were doing. They said, send her home. Send her home. If you're not going to talk to her, send her home. I'm sick of hearing her. Because you know, when you, when you experience hatred, when you experience racism, when you experience people that truly are racist, it, it is sickening. It breaks my heart because they despise the very sound of someone's voice. And I've seen it play out in people that profess to be Christians and people that profess to be godly and people that profess to know God. They may know him, but he is not in the house. He is not in their heart. He is not in their spiritual foreknowledge. He's not operating. Their elevator, <laughs> their God elevator, it ain't going all the way to the top. Their God elevator ain't going all the way to the top. Now, God's in them, sure. He made them. But for them to have hatred at the sound of someone's voice, to hear how someone talks and to despise it, this is exactly what the disciples were hearing. And they said, send her home. If you're not going to talk to her, Jesus, get her out of here. I don't want to hear her anymore. She crieth after us. And here's Jesus, man. But he answered and said, Oh, man. So I feel like God gave me this last night. Just a moment. I was sitting at my kitchen table, and I feel like God allowed me to watch this scene like a movie. Because the conversation with the disciples here is Jesus is teaching. This woman comes up. He ignores her totally. And then the conversation more than likely became, we, we got it, she don't. We're the children, she's not. We're your disciples, we're your chosen ones, but she's not. And you can almost hear Jesus hearing the disciples say, I bet, I bet, I bet, I bet the disciples were talking to each other say, I bet he ain't talking to her because she's Canaanite. He ain't talking to her because she's Canaanite. She, uh, why did she even come here? Why is she even here? We're the children. Why? And, you, and you can almost hear Jesus hearing his disciples say this and sarcastically say, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You can hear Jesus sarcastically say to his disciples with the woman standing in the corner, I'm not here for anybody but the Jews. Catch my drift here. This is what was happening, I'm telling you. His disciples were, were just living it up and thanking, just thanking their lucky stars that this Canaanite woman was getting what she deserved, nothing from God. And Jesus, with her in the corner, with her still back there wailing, son of David, son of David, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, I believe, looked at her and winked and said, You know, I'm not, I'm not here but for the Jews. I'm not here but for the chosen ones of Israel. I'm only here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him. <laughs> and that word for worship there is proskuneo, which means to lick like a dog licking his master's hand. She came in the midst of all of the hatred, in the midst of all of the judgment, in the midst of all of the lies that say that she's not included, and she fell before his feet. What in that context could have possibly caused her to do that? It had to have been Jesus looking at her and sarcastically saying, Hey, now I'm only here for the, the lost sheep of Israel. That's all I'm here for. That's all I'm here for. Something in his spiritual aura, something in his presence told her, he's inviting me in. Something in her caused her to hear the voice of God speak to her spirit and say, even though this is total outright rejection, I'm going for it. And she didn't only go for it. She worshipped him. 
Worship like a dog lick, licking his master's hand. Do you understand the adoration that a dog has for his master? Do you understand the adoration that I'm, I'm thinking about my own dogs? I'm thinking about Duchess. I have this poodle named Duchess, and when I get home, it's like her world changes. And she, she jumps up and hugs me like a human. And I don't mean to be emotional, but God is moving through this, man. His spirit moves through these animals. His spirit moves through these trees. His spirit moves because he's in all and through all and to all. It's all God. He's in everything. So this, this dog licking his master's hand, she falls before him because she adores him. She is adoring the one that is telling her she's not welcome. You understand? She is totally adoring Jesus in the moment that he's telling her it's not for you. Matthew 18 says what? Woe to the world, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to the anthropos upon whom the offense cometh. Because if you're offended, you're offended in your manhood. If you're offended, you're offended by that empty jar. If you're offended, you're offended by that empty water pot. If you're offended, you're offended by the fact that you've gave everything, you've tried everything, you've cried out to God, you've asked Him to help you, and He didn't answer. And you can choose to stay in that offense. You can choose to stay in that place of hurt. You can choose to stay in that place of brokenness. Or you can hear the voice of God, even when it sounds like he's casting you out, say, come here. And she comes and she falls and she proskuneos, she worships, she adores him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread to cast it to the dogs. And this, along with Matthew 18, this scripture here are the two of my least favorite scriptures up to this point in my life. And these two scriptures that I literally hated are what God is wrecking me with now. Because I hated the scripture that says, cut off your hand and cut off your foot and pluck out your eye. Because law only taught me how to see it through religion. And I hated this scripture because he literally calls the woman a dog. Until you find out the definition of worship. Until you find out when worship, proskuneo means to lick your master's hand like a dog. Then when he says, I'm not going to give what's for the children to the dogs, am I? Do you see the inside baseball conversation he's having with this woman? His disciples are like, what? Send her home, send her home. He's like, hey, 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 hey. You know, hey, hey, you back there. You know I'm not here, but anybody from the lost sheep of Israel, right? I know she's crazy. She's crazy. We were to send her home. I know, I know. Oh, here she is at my feet. <laughs> What's up? Help me. And then she looks up with eyes of adoration because there was something in Jesus that she saw that adored her. And when you see that Jesus adores you, even when your life looks empty, even when it looks like everything is a wreck, if Jesus adores you, it gives you the faith and the courage to come like her and bow before him and worship and proskuneo you and say, I'm giving it all. I'm giving it all. Oh, man, but he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. And here's the moneymaker. Here's the showstopper. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus said unto her, Oh, woman, <laughs> I think you laughed like that. Oh, woman, <laughs> great is your faith. <laughs> Be it unto you even as you will. And her daughter was made whole <laughs> from that very hour. 
And I believe his disciples were just totally lost and wrecked in that moment. Because everything Jesus said was not what he did. And I'm telling you, life may look like you never get what God said you were going to get. And it just isn't going to work for me. He tells me I've got a torch, but I'm holding an empty jar. But it's time to smash that jar. It's time to smash that jar and blow on that horn that he gave you to blow. He gave you a horn to blow on because you worship in spirit and in truth. The truth is you are everything he ever wanted. You don't have to add anything to it. It's you. It's always been you. And when you have that truth, you get the horn and you blow the truth, man. You blow and the Spirit of God comes upon you. And you worship in spirit and in truth as a dog licking his master's hand. She totally adored him when he was literally calling her a dog. You can choose to look at your life and say, God's not with me. I'm just the run of the litter. Or you can choose to look at your life and say, even though it don't look like it right now, I know what He spoke to me. I know what He spoke to me. I know what He's put on my life. Your situation may not look good right now. Whatever you're dealing with, you may look at it and say, God is not with me. But there's something in Him that percolates in your spirit and causes you to realize that he not only wants me he adores me he not only wants me he adores me he not only wants me to be a part of his church he wants me to be his daughter his son his friend his companion Mm. so When everybody's fighting for the head seat of the table, crave the crumbs. Crave the crumbs. You don't have to you don't have to get it all right now. That's what we want. We want everything just to be fixed right now. As a matter of fact, yesterday. (laughs) While you're at it, God, go back in time and save me from all the pain I've already felt. (laughs) But she wasn't looking for the head seat of the table. She was looking for the crumbs. She said, I'll take the leftovers because the children of Israel aren't even realizing what they have. I'll take the leftovers because when they throw out their leftovers, they throw whole rolls down here. They throw the whole meal down here. They're not even eating the meal. He, the meal is before him, and they're not eating him. They're arguing about who's going to be the head of the table. They're arguing about who's going to be on his right side. It was this same conversation that brought up the cut off your hand, cut off your foot, and pluck out your eye. Because his disciples were what? Who's going to be the greatest? And then he takes the kid. Who's going to be the greatest? And then he takes the Canaanite woman, who these racists didn't like. Yes, Yes, the disciples were racist. I'm sorry if that offends you. (laughs) Maybe it should. Maybe you should be offended. Because she had every right to be offended. She had every right to be offended. And she heard, instead of a condemnation, when when we heard condemnation, she heard invitation. When, when we hear condemnation, hear invitation. This is an invitation. So if your situation, you may be being condemned right now. You may be in a situation where you're condemned like this woman. When you hear condemnation, it's really an invitation for you to show adoration. That's as far as my Marshall Mathers goes right there. All right. I'm almost done. We're dog people. So when I say we're dog people, it's not cats versus dogs. We dog people, man. 
Where my dog's at. Yeah, yeah, there we go. I love it. I love it, man. Michael, you made my day when you did that. Oh. If you want to keep your emotional state secret, you had better steer clear of your dog. If you want to keep your emotional state a secret, you had better steer clear of your dog. I'll say it one more time. If you want to keep your emotional state a secret, you had better steer clear of your dog. Because dogs can extinguish emotions in human voices alone. Dogs can sniff out human emotions by smell alone. Dogs can recognize human emotions even in their facial expressions. There's another story that we won't dig into, but it's Lazarus and the rich man. This rich man is living, living it up. Lazarus, the, Jesus is telling this parable, by the way. It's not a real story. It's a parable. Lazarus is living it up. Got everything you could ever want, kind of like a Bill Gates or a, you know somebody we think lives a great life. <laughs> Lazarus living it up, or the rich man's living it up. He's living it up. And then Lazarus, the beggar, the crippled man, the poor man laying at his gate every day is begging for his help, begging for anything, begging for crumbs. Fast forward in this story, you know, it gets into the whole great divide and Abraham's bosom thing, you know. It's a, trans, it's, it's a reversal of life. Because on the other side, it's the poor man that is living it up and Lazarus that is, or, or the rich man that is struggling, right? But the key with this story is what? Lazarus wasn't alone. Every evening in this parable, the neighborhood dogs would come and lick his sores. And I remember my grandma telling me this story, and she would tell it in, a, in kind of a like a, Oh, yeah, he was so bad off a dog would lick him. You know, it was just kind of a, but now I'm seeing this through a truth, man. This, these dogs were caring for the man that people weren't even caring for. That's why dogs are, man, they're awesome. They're my best friends sometimes. I can go, yeah, Andrew, you can recognize that. Yeah, he spoke, he's like, oh, yeah. That's my, where my dog's at? Andrew's like, yeah, they're my friends. That's my friend. I know what he's talking He's preaching to me now. That's my friend, my dog. I know what a dog friend is. I got a dog friend at home. You know, we know dogs. We know their friend, their man's best friend. I went through a terrible depression as a teenager, and I remember a point in my life when I had this golden retriever named Champ, and I feel like that dog was the only one who understood me. I would go home, and I would sit there, and I would cry, and my dog would just, like, stand there so proud. I would be sitting beside of him, and I would just hold on to that dog and cry as a teenager. And he would stand there as God himself. I see it now, man. It wasn't just a dog. It's God crying out from the rocks. Because if these people don't worship, the rocks will. If these people don't love you, the dogs will. But we're dog people. <laughs> We adore him. All right, I'm going to read this and I'll be done. <clears throat> I typed this up the other day. I took out the parts that Josh and them made fun of. <laughs> Adoration. This is the key. No, we're, I'm, I'm, we have a great time, man. I love them. I love them. I may promise you I'm dishing it out much more than they are probably. Adoration. This is the key word to comprehend. To truly adore someone is total and complete, complete abandon of reputation. Adoration is the antithesis of power. This is the behavior that defines a dog. The term puppy love is used frequently when teenagers fall in love. How many has been accused of being in puppy love? Teenagers have not yet established a reputation in this society that is driven by power, mimicking the ideals of historical dominance hierarchy. So when teenagers fall in love, they fall pretty hard with their whole being. Puppy love is a fascinating concept. 
It insinuates that the love displayed in the elementary stages of a relationship are fleeting and temporary, destined to change as the puppy grows. The puppy signifying the relationship that is relatively new or young, but especially untested and immature. But is the relationship immature? Or is this the beautiful true expression of hearts not predicated on reputation, power, and dominance? The puppy may grow into a dog. The puppy will grow into a dog. There ain't no may about it. The puppy will grow into a dog. But the spirit, oh, now I see what I was doing. Anyway. The puppy may grow into a dog, but the spirit of that animal is a different story. The human reaction and perception of the dog weakens in some cases primarily because the appearance of the dog has changed. The tiny puppy has now been replaced by a giant couch hawk. The puppy breath that once melted the hearts of the owner has since been replaced by the undeniable persistent force that is halitosis, a.k.a. dog breath. In all these external changes, however, the dog's heart remains constant. They simply adore their masters. The masters that displayed such love and adoration in the puppy stages. The puppy met the child in you and never stopped believing that's who you really are. This is the most beautiful part for Chris and I as we're breeding golden doodles Seeing owners, seeing adults, especially empty nesters, return to a childlike wonder, revealing their true selves when they come to take the puppy home. Adoration sometimes wanes in human relationships when responsibilities evolve and priorities change. When we begin to follow the systematic formula, our very own empty water pot gifted to us by Anthropos himself. I'm talking about money. That stuff that so many believe makes the world go round is also the key ingredient to inflate reputation in the pursuit of power, defining social statuses by the abundance or lack thereof. When this happens, love that was for all intents and purposes real love is then categorized as puppy love. Oh, but what a secret Abba has for us now. Real love, puppy love. When we realize that Jesus is the puppy in our story, he never stopped loving us. Like the puppy that never stopped believing his owner was the child he first met. He never stopped adoring us for who we truly are. When we discover his adoration for us, it changes our lives. Because we can in turn let the true children come out of the shadows of Anthropos and love him back. Not only love him, but adore him. Because we don't love him with the accomplishments of the law and Anthropos. We adore him because he first adored us and never stopped. What would our worship look like if it was truly predicated on his adoration of us? Really, what would our worship look like if it was truly predicated on his adoration of us? I believe it would look like credence tackling me at the door when I get home. <laughs> Giggling uncontrollably when I speak sweetly to her. I believe it would look like a once-shattered woman discovering she was a saint and dropping her water pot to run back into life at full speed. A faithful mother returning home to find her daughter that was once ridden with illness, now smiling and dancing in the light of her mother's faith and adoration. I believe it would look like a dog licking its master's hand. These are, and we are, true worshipers of Jesus. The hour is coming, and now is, that the true worshipers arise. Like Gideon, the run of the litter. The child we really are is arising from within, awoken by the adoration of puppy Jesus, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. We are dog people. When I think about Sister Diane, who we're honoring today, I don't know if I've met anybody that adores God like her. She adores God. And you know why I know? Because she adores Him and me. Because she realizes that we are gods. She realizes that you can't just throw people away. There would be a lot of people that would really smile if they had gotten their way with Pastor and Diane. 
but they didn't throw people away. They built a ministry on keeping people. They built a ministry on keeping people. They built a ministry on not sending the people home. So as we honor her today, I want you all to give her just the biggest hug you could possibly give her for loving you the way she loves you and loving us the way she loves us. Because she, she is, man. She is the love of God in physical manifestation. I mean, she is truly a saint and our mother. So, I'm done. Thankful for y'all listening to all of this that was rambling and, uh, you know, sometimes wild. But say it with me. I adore him because he first adored me.